or wait? Yeah, share it now would be great. Good morning and welcome for everyone as you join today. We're really excited to connect with you today to help you understand connections between the Advantage MR, AVMR framework and the Universal Screeners for Number Sense. Just give everyone a couple minutes to join. We have our folks who are early and right on time. So again, good morning and welcome as you join. Man. And Kristen, where are you calling in from today? I am calling in from Michigan and we're in a big snowstorm right now. It hasn't stopped snowing. <laughs> so hopefully we don't lose internet. <laughs> All right. And I'm in, I'm in Erie, Colorado and uh, wanting more snow. <laughs> yeah, great we have some as you join too please do just share a drop in chat where you're calling from or where you're joining us from today we have someone else from michigan someone from alabama upper michigan nice. massachusetts wisconsin michigan texas we had some people sign up from yeah, awesome. internationally too, but I guess this is probably in the middle of the night for them. So they'll, they'll probably be watching tomorrow on demand. Awesome. I see lots of Michigan friends and some familiar names. Hey. Hey, James so Denning from Cheyenne. Nice to see you. Okay, so again, welcome to everyone. We're really excited today to present with you connections between the AVMR framework and the Universal Screeners for Number Sense. We do have a pretty robust presentation plan. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started with our first question to everyone who's joining us today. So our first question, I'm gonna launch a poll here shortly, is are you trained in AVMR or math recovery? The options are not trained but curious, I'm not trained but others in my building are AVMR certified or math recovery specialist. i go ahead and launch that now. So my question is for those of us who are both AVMR certified and math recovery specialist, I guess we round up to math recovery specialist, right? <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, I'm not allowed to vote anyways as a panelist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So some of those are fine, are dropping that in chat too. So those that are both, <laughs> hey, it does make you choose here. Either okay. way, we'll know that you've had experience with math recovery. <laughs> so, great. Okay. Hi, Jennifer. I do remember you from <laughs> our IS and our, our journeys. Welcome. I'm gonna go ahead and share out our results here. Nice. So, okay, pretty even spread. Hmm? Yeah. And I think that you could share those on the screen somehow for the folks. I can't remember how to do that though. You should see that now. You Are you seeing that now, David? Cause I just I'm shared seeing, it. I'm seeing it on my side screen. Um, oh. So they probably are, maybe other people are as well. I'm not sure. Awesome. I'll just share the high level. So we have 20% not trained but curious, 12% not trained but others in my building are, 33% AVMR certified, 35% uh, math recovery specialist, and then some of those are sharing too in chat when you're both. So thank you for finding that that creative worker out there. <laughs> All right. Um, awesome. So I have the pleasure of, before I, I launch into presentations, I'm just going to share a couple of administrative notes before we get started. So the session is being recorded. If you do have to leave early, don't worry, you'll get a recording via email within 24 hours. Um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A tool. We will reserve a few minutes at the end of today's presentation to be answering those. If you do have questions that are specifically uh, for Kristen or specifically for David to 
please also add that so that we can make sure that we're pointing those questions to the right person to best answer them. So without further ado, I have the pleasure today of introducing David Woodward, who's founder and president of Forefront Education and also leads the open source Universal Screeners for Number Sense project. Uh, he has uh, decades of experience in education, ranging from a pre-K Montessori teacher to elementary math specialist of Boulder Valley School District. Uh, he recently joined the company full-time too in 2020, 2020, so we have the pleasure of, of having him work full-time with what was his side hustle for over a decade. <laughs> um, I also have the pleasure of introducing Kristen Frank. Kristen Frank is the AEMR Implementation Director at the U.S. Math Recovery Council. She also has decades of experience, 20 years of experience in K-12 mathematics education. In addition to 13 years in secondary mathematics classrooms, she served as an instructional coach, director of the statewide math recovery math and science partnership grant, and also works as a consultant in resource assistance for mathematics curriculum instruction and assessment. And she is extremely passionate about uh, fostering mathematical identities for our youngest learners. So I'll turn it to you. All right. Thank you very much. So we're going to start with this because this is kind of what's, what what kind of prompted the whole the whole conversation. We get a lot of questions because people will find in the fall screeners they'll they'll, they'll see at the bottom under each of the sections AVMR number of words and numerals uh, assessment recommended or or the multiplication division assessment recommended, and people are always very curious about this. And so um, we wanted to make sure that we um, made that connection for people here with this webinar today. So thank you for joining us, Kristen. Yeah. Um, uh, so let's move to that next slide. So we we talk about um, number sense and screening within within a uh, a full system of stu of school improvement processes, right? This idea of screening for for information and then collecting that formative data, and then and then on to how do we improve the instructional processes that we provide for students. Um, you know, throughout throughout the the units that, that we're teaching or or interventions, if it will be whatever it might be, right? But just trying to constantly improve, and the universal screeners to provide a quick assessment to identify the schools and the the skills and concepts that indicate readiness or or need for readiness for the content. So, um, on the next slide, just kind of focusing in on the universal screeners for just a second and letting people know what a little bit about the history of this project going back to about 2007 is when we started working on these screeners um, in Boulder Valley School District. There was a group of leaders there at the time, Lisa Mesplay and Derek Laser. I don't know if they're here today, but they um, we, we got together and said, hey, we really would like something that we really fast for us to be able to to help people to to screen students and understand um, what they're doing. And it was all kind of the development of the thing was very much informed by our work with Advantage Math. I had been recently trained in that um, by Dara and, and Lisa, who were, I think, um, members of the original cohort of teachers who got trained in, in Advantage Math. And, um, and so we're very excited about it. And so that's why those connections are super strong to the universal screener um, as it is. But I kind of wanted to ask you, um, Chris. Oh, I got actually I got one more slide for me. Then I guess. Sorry, I'm. I, did I run into yours? <laughs> That's okay. So, so when when uh, Forefront then got got founded, right? We we then talked about. Um, our, our, you know, the, the data that's coming from the screeners and we collect the data that comes from these screeners here. And I'm just gonna explain this one report here that we've made some screenshots of. So this is the second grade fall screener. And what you'll see here is that we have every one of the questions um, and you can see those numbered across the top, one, two, three, four. And then this is uh, data from our global, um, our global, cohort, as we call it, for the screeners. And we've circled out questions two and three and five and six um, to kind of emphasize those as they seem to be areas of struggle because the green areas on these graphs show those students who are fully proficient, the yellows who are approaching proficiency and those who are in the orange are kind of in that not yet group, the, the below basic as it's called on this report. So um, we wanna think about, okay, what do our students know? And, and what do we want to know more about and where might we want to spend more time? And so, so 
what we're we're going to ask for you, Kristen, today is to sort of say, okay, so we've got people who have done the screeners and they've collected this information, and so then, how does this look once you put on the lens of Advantage Math, and how does that enhance this information for the teachers? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, just a quick connection. Derek Laser was my AVMR facilitator as well. So how funny is that? A small yeah. world. So Derek, if you're on, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I want to come back to this view here because, you know, oftentimes when we think about those assessment systems, it has a lot of meanings for a lot of different people. And so really thinking in this webinar about actionable ways for teachers to use data in their classrooms to move student learning forward. And so we often bring teachers together in these PLCs and they get these reports and they're at a loss for how to think about advancing student thinking in their classes. Um, they might analyze the results from a correctness or an incorrectness kind of way and then reteach or kind of repeat what they have in the past. So speaking from an AVMR lens, I'm going to just bring up a quote that I love from the Taking Action series. So I'm going to pause for 15 seconds so people can read that. There's a misconception that AVMR is about assessment itself. And really, AVMR is a professional learning that supports teachers in being able to listen and observe student thinking beyond those right and wrong answers. They learn about uh, research-based learning trajectories that lay out how students' mathematical thinking develops and builds on previous knowledge. This is knowledge that many teachers haven't had access to in their um, pre-service programs or maybe even in their curriculum trainings within their buildings. This gives them a way to observe students and interpret student thinking in real time during instruction. So we don't have to wait till the end of instruction to be able to respond to students' needs. We can still do some targeted support with students, but we can also watch during a whole class lesson, just listening to them, observing, and understanding these learning trajectories and how students progress helps us to make classroom decisions for students and making sure that we're supporting where their current knowledge is and where they go um, for next steps. All right, you know, this this quote here reminds me of my first experiences with Advantage Math um, as I was getting trained and and having, you know, through this kind of careful observation of students like you're talking about, and then that training of our observational skills through yeah. the program, I, I remember seeing things when I got back to the classroom, seeing things that I had not ever noticed before after having worked with students for literally, uh, you know, almost two decades by the time that that had happened. Um, and I was just, all of a sudden I was like, whoa, hold on. My eyes were were revealed to new things. And, and so this idea of, of how it enhances our ability to gather information, understand students and observe their actions, I think is really powerful. Yeah. It is meant, you know, in our mission statement it is to empower educators. It's it's meant to empower educators because we know that educators have a huge influence on how students learn mathematics. So it's not just about having a high quality resource. We do want a high quality resource, but how that high quality resource is put into action is equally as important. So I want to talk a little bit about our learning framework in number in Advantage Math Recovery. There is a QR code that will bring you to the next slide that I'm going to show, but I just want to um, put for our, our friends who are with us today who haven't had math recovery training, I want to put this into kind of context of what the course is. So the learning framework in number is a research framework that is the basis of all math recovery learning. So whether you're in a math recovery specialist course or you're in an advantage math recovery course. So um, math recovery specialist is focused on those intervention settings and um, advantage math recovery is the classroom setting. Both of them use the exact same research base. It's not different. It's this learning framework and number, which is those learning trajectories around observable student behavior. So how do we understand how students are learning addition and subtraction within our classrooms? What's a normal progression for them to go through? It's made up of nine key domains. So on the next screen, you're gonna see this really colorful page 
Um, like I said, that, that QR code is there. Oh, I, I'm not showing you this. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was showing you. This is the, the trouble with having too many screens, right? You have all these different <laughs> screens up. So I'll pause so you can uh, grab that QR code. The learning framework in number does help us to be strategic in our observations in the classroom. So we're not just going in and um, wondering what we should be looking for. The learning framework actually focuses our observations. So when we look at this graphic, now this graphic along the left side is just lays out the common core state standards. You might have a different set of standards. So you could lay out your domains from your different states. Um, I just use the Common Core because it's a pretty popular one. So when you're looking at this, you can see the domains of the Common Core. So we know we have these big chunks of mathematical content. Well, within those domains, this is where the learning framework comes in. So that second column are the domains of the learning framework, those nine domains. And you can see how that knowledge progresses across grade levels. So we learn what's happening in first grade, you know, we're starting to work on number word sequences, we're working on them, really working hard on them in first grade and consolidating them in second and third grade. So you can kind of see that progression of knowledge overlaid on the standards. What I want to point out, though, is these questions over here to the right, which were the questions from the, um, the screener data that we saw earlier. And we saw in that screener data that around 40% of our incoming second graders um, might have a need in this area. So they're not getting a... Um, you know, a correct answer on the screener. And we want to dig in a little bit deeper. We want to know more. We're also curious though, we know that this is these are the problem types that are being consolidated in a second grade classroom. So we know that some of our students are not yet ready for grade level content. Some are ready for grade level content, but we're not sure at what sophistication they're answering those questions. Are they answering them at that sophistication level that the standards is requiring? So what I'm getting from this, Kristen, is is that that we're taking we're taking kind of the big scope that might be laid out by our curricula or the Common Core or our state standards or whatever it might be, and through Advantage Math, we're able to get a lot more specific on this, and very detailed in terms of our approaches to where students are and how we're going to support them going forward. Is that the way you see it? Yeah, that is the way I see it. And then I see those nine domains. So what we learn about is those nine domains are distinct areas. So I can look at just those two domains where these two problems fall. But I also learn that there's an interconnectedness between some of the other domains. So mm -hmm. that's where it might be helpful for a teacher to say, for most of my class, I'm going to follow the trajectories in addition and subtraction to 20. And I'm going to maybe back up to this first grade working stage, um, knowing that 40% of my students are not ready. So I might try to kind of back up just a little bit before I move forward into that second grade. But I might have a group of students that I need to dig a little bit deeper on to understand what kind of targeted support. And that targeted support might not be an addition and subtraction to 20. It might be in a completely different area. And that is the, the screener helped me to understand that that's what I need to dig into. Now I'm digging in really deep to answer those questions about specific student needs. Right. So that's where those assessments that kind of come with, with uh, Advantage Math can allow us to do that deeper digging, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. It can allow us to do deeper digging. All right. I also want to show, though, what it looks like for a classroom teacher. So sometimes we think about Advantage Math Recovery as that targeted support piece, which is an amazing support for teachers to understand how to dig deep, how to develop a profile on a student to develop that targeted support. But I also have a classroom full of students that I want to think about and observe as well. So when I'm looking at a lesson, this is just a, like a second grade addition and subtraction. You can see the purpose is exploring strategies for adding and subtracting through 10. This is a ready set math lesson. Um, it's a resource that we've developed um, at US Math Recovery. It's supposed to be um, a support for teachers in the classroom. It's not a full curriculum. I just want to you know, make sure as I'm showing a lesson. Yeah. Um, but the purpose of this is really to just look at any lesson that looks like this. How would an ABMR trained teacher 
use their assessment results to enact this lesson because really the enactment of the lesson is the most powerful part, not just having the lesson and the tools on the table. So there are some ways that we learn in our courses about supporting students. So I'm, I want to think about scaffolding learning to grade level standards. So I'm not in an intervention scenario. I'm not in a small group setting. I'm thinking about a group of students who I might have some assessment data on at, that says they might not be ready. So what do I need to think about from a classroom standpoint to support all of the learners in my classroom? One of the things that AVMR teachers learn to do is adjust the range of numbers. So I might come into this second grade lesson and I might think about, oh, they're not yet ready for this particular range of numbers. So I'm gonna change that range of numbers, but they're still accessing the grade level lesson and the content. A second way that we learn in our Advantage Math Recovery courses to support students um, to access those grade level is the strategic use of tools. There's many research reports out there. Um, Deborah Ball has uh, a paper on the magic of manipulatives. They're not magic. And so we want to be able to use those manipulatives so that students are manipulating and learning the mathematics. The math isn't the tool, the math is in the student's head and we're trying to help them bring that visual to life so that they can enact that mathematics with a manipulative. And so that strategic use of the tools, not just the 10 frame. I have a really good friend who used to say, yeah, I just threw the tools on the table and it looked like I was teaching amazing math lessons. And, you know, I got to check because I had those tools out. But the way that I ask questions to to really help students think about important mathematical ideas, to think about missing add-ins, um, to think about developing you know, a visual in their mind, that I learned how to do that as a teacher. And those questions are powerful ways to encourage students to develop that knowledge for themselves. And then finally, another way is the use of color coding and notating to make the connection with that visual that we were just talking about and the strategic use of the tools. So I'm asking these questions, but I need to connect it to that abstract mathematical notation so that when a child sees nine plus six, they then can visualize, oh, nine plus six, that's that 10 frame. Yeah, I can move one. And they, they can really use that relational thinking in mathematics. Those things, we could focus just on learning our, you know, this in this particular lesson, we can focus on, you know, learning our facts. But the idea that I can take things apart and put them back together and I can visualize that, I can think about nine plus six, what's a problem that will help me solve nine plus six, all of that has um, really big implications later in mathematics. So when I go to do that algebraic reasoning, if I can pull apart whole numbers, I can pull apart functions. Or if I'm looking at a fraction, I'm not afraid to take it apart if I've done that with whole numbers. There's just there's just so much here, you know, that 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 reminds me of why I love uh, math recovery and, and AVMR. You know, I mean, first of all, you've got you've got this idea that we're getting super specific, right? That it's not that we're we're understanding students as they're going through these incremental day by day growth, right? And and we know that you know these are all second grade concepts, and these kids are growing so fast. And, and our ability to be able to kind of put on that lens to be able to see that growth, I think, is so important. And 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 helping with these sub goals A, B, C, and helping people to understand what those are those are doing, I think, is so important. The other thing that kind of comes out at me here, and and I'm I'm curious what what language you guys think of with this, because this really reminds me a lot of that concrete, representational, abstract idea that that people throw around a lot. I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, I know there's a lot more to it in math recovery. Do you use that language or similar language? How do you how do you think about that? Yeah, I like to use um, language from some of the researchers. So the concrete representational abstract, I think, is one application of it, but it's very linear. And I think how we like to think about it, Bob Wright describes, and we talk about this in our courses all the time, this dance where we move forward and we move backward and we bring in a visual and then we take it away. So it's not this like, I start here and I end at the abstract. It's this idea that I have flexibility. And so depending on the task, I might move in and out of that. 
the visual is really important for the conversation. So I might start there, but sometimes I might start with the abstract and then bring in a visual to support it. So it's really not about a linear pathway. It's about, do you have connections? Um, I think that uh, some of the research around the different models, so can you describe it, you know, in words or with a story? Can you connect it to symbolic? You know, having those multiple representations and moving between those is much more important important than the the linear pathway. Yeah, that's that thank you. That's what I I was thinking too, you know, as I think about this and 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 how I mean I think there's been an uh, an effort on on part of some people just to try to oversimplify things, right? And I think I think one of the things that math recovery does is to appreciate the complexity of this and that this is not easy stuff even though it might look for us as adults this idea of 9 plus 6 is 15 and that if we would just memorize it we'd be just fine right and and yet we recognize that children uh, you know humans were very complex in our thinking and and that that it's not just a straight line and that not every student is going to follow the same sequence of ideas, right? And that we need to be able to understand the students first and foremost in order to be able to respond um, instructionally, right? Yeah, and I appreciate you bringing all of that up. You know, it's so important. Like I said, I'm so interested in students' identities that their experiences are really important building blocks for them. So not just their mathematical experiences, but their life experiences that they bring into the classroom that we can use to like build on the strengths that they already have because they come in with lots of strengths. Awesome, yeah. So I just wanna go back to the lesson. It's, you know, really quickly to point out, okay, so we looked at kind of the blank lesson to begin with the Ready, Set, Math. And then we said, what would this look like through the AVMR lens? And you can kind of see, I've taken this lesson and just written, if you know me, this is actually my writing because it's so messy, you can tell I can't read it. Um, but I might be scratching some notes to myself before a lesson. So, you know, if I look at that top part there, I have adjusting number combinations. So I can think about different ranges of students and what numbers might be most impactful for them. Um, I can think about the strategic use of tools. So I'm going to bring in those 20 frames. What kinds of questions am I going to pre-plan for students so that I'm being strategic and helping them to develop their thinking? Um, the notation piece. I don't want to leave in the classroom out the connection to the symbolic because we know that's a really important part of their progression of the grade level standards. So how am I going to connect those things? So I'm just kind of making notes on that um, to help me be intentional as the classroom teacher as I'm enacting the lesson. And then I always have that planned formative assessment. So I don't have to wait till the next benchmark assessment. I don't have to wait till that next screener. I don't have to wait till the end of the unit. I know right now where my students are at and what they need. And I'd be observing, you know, different students. So it might look like a grid that's just open. I have some student names. I want to observe who's fluent to 10 and I'm going to write myself some notes because it might impact my next lesson or it might help me to think about who do I need to provide that targeted support to? Who do I need to advance? So it's not always just about targeted support and catching students up. Um, it's, it's just about helping them to target the range of numbers or the, the needs that they specifically have. And that includes accelerating students. And I always like to say accelerating students isn't just going to the next grade level of, of work. We can do lots of different things to complexify a task so that students are in the same grade level, but going much deeper with that content. Yeah, this this reminds me of another term just it gets thrown out a whole lot in, in the education world about differentiation yep. right and and so what we're really talking about here is that is that we've got a wide variety with the, of students with a wide variety of needs and that we need to be able to have put on that that understanding that we get from from a, a you know a trained eye to be able to understand how to meet the needs of that student where they're at in a variety of ways, like you're saying, and, and that we can tweak a variety of things. We might change the numbers a little bit. We might change the, the expectations in terms of con contexts and other things like this, or, or the notation that we're using, but that we can, we can complexify and we can change that task or simplify that task as needed in a very agile kind of way once, we're, once we know what to do, right? 
Absolutely. Okay. And when we do those things and when we're watching students, you know, the intentional observation of mathematics, we intentionally observe a lot of things about our students in our classrooms and the amount of decisions that we have to make. So being intentional about watching for specific mathematics adds another layer, but helps us to build a continued whole child profile of what their strengths are in the classroom. I was just listening to um, a report recently about the impact that teachers ability to notice mathematical strengths and name a specific example for students is one of the most powerful ways to advance student thinking. So just saying, hey, good job, you tried really hard. Or when you asked that question and your group got unstuck, I know that you were persevering and that's a strength that you have is gonna help them understand how to enact those mathematics and, and build that identity in the classroom. So when we know what to look for, we're better at giving those, um, those you know, specific ways that students are um, competent in our classes. Sorry, that was a hard word for me to come up with in that moment. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. It's 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 complex. It is. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you know, and it just remind me as we as we go on to the next slide, I just want to remind everyone that we will be coming to the question and answer um, session at the end of this. So if, if questions are starting to come into your mind, um, drop them into that Q&A thing there so that uh, Kristen and I can and go come at those. So we're coming back to this slide that we had up earlier, um, you know, yeah. with these these four questions, right, around counting these number word sequences, as well as um, the addition and subtraction problem. And what what struck me as we were planning for this thing, and and what what you know really comes out right now is okay, we've asked two very simple kinds of questions in some ways, yeah, and yet at the same time, through putting the lens of advantage math on this and and the uh, and the math recovery work suddenly there's a lot of depth to this and there's a lot of color to it and there's a lot of things that we think about in terms of being able to scaffold the learning for the grade level right and beyond and and in between and all that stuff right and then really applying that targeted instruction in a variety of ways yeah. right and then and thinking beyond the topic right yeah, and when I look at these specifically, you know, from that AVMR lens, I look at the purple and I think, ooh, what do I need to do? And that was kind of the lesson that I just showed to scaffold the learning. But now I also want to think about that group of students who in the in that 40% range were not seeing the success that we want them to have for grade level standards. And so I'm thinking about those other domains in the chart and I'm thinking about how do I dig deeper? What, what are the areas that I need to uncover to support them? Well, right away, I can see on the screener, there is another area that's connected. So 14 remove three, it might be because there's a group of students who can't count back 23 minus 10. And I'm seeing some equal data there, right? I'm seeing some correspondence between, you know, 14 remove three. And then I also see the count back, you know, uh, 23. So whoops, I'm sorry. I have like a, a happy cursor or a happy mouse there. So right here, you know, I'm seeing this question um, right here, 14 remove three. And then I'm actually looking at that data as well. So it's giving me some indication of where I could dig deeper with those AVMR assessments to provide scaffolded support. It also makes me wonder about students that I want to, you know, extend their learning. So from that AVMR lens, sorry, I'm really struggling there. You know, I can think about here I am in that scaffolding. I might be adjusting the range of numbers, but I also want to think about the targeted instruction. You can see this blue box here. What are those things that I'm going to provide targeted instruction around? And I can go right into my frameworks and I can think about where are they at once I pose those assessment tasks and what are the lessons I'm going to pull to make sure that I'm supporting those needs that are just in time support so that they can access the grade level standards. Or I could think about the frameworks, the learning framework and number and extending. What's the next step? What's the next set of learning for those students? And how could I provide that for the group of students who might already have achieved that benchmark? So AVMR is a way that I can take a look at those assessment results, use a little bit more you know, diagnostic assessments to figure out how do I extend or provide that targeted support. Okay, so let me see if I'm getting this. So, so it, it really, when we're talking about AVMR and the Ready Set Math and the work of uh, work of math recovery, we're talking about 
first of all, kind of a conceptual framework for us to understand students and how they develop. And we come to know that construction, that, that framework through assessing students and observing students and working with students, right? Yeah. And then also we kind of get a little toolbox that yeah. will help us to, to be able to, to put that into action in our classrooms with, with advantage math, as well as the, the ready set math materials. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it gives me really specific things to try, right? So yeah. I know the range, I can back up one step, I can move forward one step. I'm not trying to make four steps forward and wondering why students, I'm repeating myself over and over and over again, because they're not yet at that space where their, you know, experiences are in the place that they could hang on to that content. So before I can do that, I want to make sure that I'm thinking about those prerequisites and that just-in-time support. Awesome. So uh, just an example, you know, the targeted instruction in that area, um, you know, they might be thinking about, you know, like accounting strategy. So even though we want a second grade student to use strategies to add through 10, they might actually need to create um, a, a unit themselves or a composite unit. And so we're working on accounting up. And then those students who, you know, might be ready for a different range of numbers, I can extend to that double digit range. So Ready, Set, Math is just a way. Um, it's a great tool to see the learning framework in action. Um, and so we could see how we might adjust that kind of same idea in different directions to meet the needs of all of our students. Awesome. Okay, so coming back to this this circle here, right? This, so we're we're thinking we got we have the universal screeners that kind of come in as as an initial assessment, right? That give us that quick kind of understanding of where students are, where they might need supports, and things like this. But really understanding the student and way that they're thinking and the way that they're approaching these problems as well, right? And that's one of those things people you know who are using universal screeners for number sense. I you know we've we've designed them in a way that they're simple to to use without the trained eye and yet at the same time it's so much more impactful when they really do understand okay so i've seen these behaviors on the nine plus six task for example that we kind of been going to today and and that it's not just whether they got it right or wrong but yeah. how they're approaching that problem the kinds of of, of of strategies that they're applying either successfully or maybe partially successfully and really kind of zoning in honing in on that that thing so that so that when when we are are looking at those results they give us all of this formative information it's not just data at that point in time it's on beyond data it's the data and all the information around that in terms of the behaviors that we've seen and observed in all of this so that we can really meet the students where they are and design instruction to to really improve schools and and students you know and their work right and so so it's just a piece of the picture um, and that AVMR can really put that lens on on learning that helps teachers to be able to respond in ways that really do improve student outcomes. You know, one more thing that I just want to, you know, I heard you say so many times throughout this entire presentation, and there's been so much about research mm -hmm. in math education and, um, and, and how we understand the way that students learn. And that was one of the things that I really appreciated. And, and, and it opened up for me a whole bank of research, right, mm -hmm. that really has been going on literally for decades, yeah. Um, but kind of packaged in a way that it's easy for a practitioner like me to understand and apply in my classroom. And that the, this really does have a very, very strong research base going back uh, for a very long time. And, and I'm just, just to put this out there because I think it's so cool is, is how the, the, it's ongoing and it's so yeah. live, you know, I mean, math recovery, I've been a part of the math recovery community now for, you know, 20 years, almost, uh, well, let's call it 15 and and every time I come back to either a math recovery conference or I see that there's a new publication out, it's like the research continues to happen. It's just an ongoing thing. We're still discovering. We're still learning. And it's a learning environment. It's a learning community that you really yeah. become a part of when you when you join the math recovery. Yeah, you know, and I think um, one of our most recent publications, we call it the Pink Book. 
um, really does lay out how math recovery research situates itself in um, the broader world of math education research. It is this framework that brings together all of these pieces in a way that's actionable for a teacher in a classroom or for an interventionist in an intervention setting. But it also speaks to, you know, the taking action quote. It's, it speaks to how we're providing supports in our classrooms and opening up this way for students to experience uh, mathematics and in ways that are powerful and actually pay off in later grades. So it's it's not just about those correct answers and, and moving students to the you know, the accountability test, which, you know, we know that we can get some results in accountability, but it doesn't mean that later on we're preparing our future mathematicians or scientists or, um, you know, engineers that we want to develop mindsets. And that's my favorite thing about the research base that we're from and how we're connecting to this larger, you know, research base is that we're looking for what is the mathematics that's repeatable and powerful and actually has an impact later on, not just to get us to our grade level benchmarks. Absolutely. The only other thing I want to say about this is, you know, I think we said before that, you know, a system of data has lots of different uses. And sometimes we come to a universal screener and we think it's going to be, you know, this overarching answer and it's going to give us diagnostic data when really it's, it is designed. You said, you know, when you were thinking about this in Boulder, you wanted a quick test to kind of point us in the directions to dig deeper, right? So I have some information and now I can go into my classroom because that's a reality of our classrooms. Time is always a reality, you know, of mm -hmm. what we don't have in our classrooms. So that universal screener is important and the formative classroom data is important. Sometimes we do have, you know, these assessments that we're trying to repurpose in all these different ways. So I just caution people to think about what is your purpose for your data and how are you taking action on that? What do you know and what don't you know? And that's what's going to have the impact on that student improvement is the things that you don't know, how are you going to find them out? <laughs> you know, and that's that real classroom actionable data. It's not that our assessments tell us everything. They kind of point us in a direction and they help us to dig deeper. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, you know, and, and we, one of the things we keep saying over and over again is, is how, you know, assessment is about learning mm -hmm. and it's really about the teacher's learning, you yeah. know, what, how, what their students know and, and, and how do we serve them better? Cause once we understand our students, then we can teach better. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so, so this, this idea that, you know, a, a quality screener, you know, this, you know, there's, there's a number of different screeners out there that people are using. What we really wanted, you know, in designing our universal screeners was was a screener that would give as much information that was really helpful for for teacher learning yeah. as quickly as possible and yeah. to help them. Right. To say, OK, listen, now I need to slow down and and and, and really observe this student more closely is, is part of that and really think about how I'm going to support specific students, maybe more than than other students need it in in terms of the the, the intensity that we provide for them. But. Nevertheless, it's just about learning and understanding all of our students that was really going to help us to be better teachers. Yes, exactly. And good assessment is at the heart of good teaching, right? So when we think about good teaching, we're assessing simultaneously. And mm -hmm. we just have to be intentional about those things that we're watching for. Right. And then let me just emphasize that real quick before we move on. Um, is, is you talk about the ability to assess effectively on, on an ongoing thing. And that, you know, just to come back to this, that Advantage Math, ABMR is not just a simple set of assessments, right. but that once you are trained in this framework and understand the framework of learning that we're talking about here, that you will, you will see these things in your classroom and be able to observe them in your classroom without the use of the assessment. That while the students are working on problems, you'll be like, ah, there it is. I recognize that behavior right there. Yeah. That's it's it it indicates a certain level of learning along these trajectories that we don't necessarily have to get from the assessment that, but we can get it while we're working with our students. Super powerful. Yeah. Yeah. 
I know that we're getting to the question and answer time. Um, I did talk about uh, a few things. I just want to bring up um, another QR code. I'll give you a little bit more time. Um, you know, we were talking about Advantage Meth Recovery um, today. Uh, those are the assessments that David said are, you know, referenced in the, the screener. Um, that is for our classroom application. Math recovery specialist is really in the for those um, intervention settings, uh, push in, pull out, either one. But it is meant for um, the areas that we've identified for intervention, and it is a much um, more intensive class in terms of time and uh, time spent in the course, as well as time spent working with students. And then Ready, Set, Math, like I said, was a resource that we developed. We've been asked for years, what does this look like in a, a classroom lesson? What does it look like to use the learning trajectories? And so it is a supplementary resource that people could look at to say, if I were thinking about this specific learning trajectory, so maybe a place value learning trajectory, what does that look like in a classroom setting? And how would I support students with the, that, those differentiated lessons? And so that's what um, Ready, Set, Math is. The QR code is just a, a form that will take you to um, just a, a, a general form. So if you wanted some more information and uh, for us to send you some information on any of those uh, three products. Amber, you're muted. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm not good at multitasking here. So I'm just kind of monitoring questions here. Uh, we have quite a few, some that I'm not able to answer. So I'm going to be sh uh, sharing those with both of you here shortly. Uh, but in the follow-up, we will be sharing some of these links. I've noticed some names from some of our client districts. So if you do have questions about how to configure account to uh, collect data from the ABMR diagnostic assessments or wish to go into further detail, please reach out to support uh, that link, that QR code that's provided on this slide too. We'll just drop you to our website so that knowledge base and the way that you can connect with support is also provided on our website. If you're new to the Universal Screeners for Number Sense and this is the first time that you're hearing about them, um, please go to our website, download them. You can get the entire assessment guide, K through six and English and Spanish. It's, it's quite a document there, um, completely for free and watch the videos to understand what these interview-based assessments could look like in your classrooms. We welcome you to join a community of over 40,000 downloads since those have been moved to our website just a couple of years ago. Um, if you currently use the Universal Screeners for Number Sense, I did notice some questions about what is the data solution that was shared in the earlier slides. Um, I will be sharing a quick demo in the follow-up so that you can see what the software solution could look like in your classrooms. I also encourage you to connect with us on our website. So if you reach out to us through via contact us too, we're happy to start a conversation with you to share more about what that software could look like. Um, and, and then the last slide, we're going to turn it to our audience here. As, as I said, we do have quite a few questions, and I'm glad that we have a few uh, about 15 minutes here to answer them. Um, and so there were quite a few questions, Kristen, that came in for the slide that you shared that was looking at the Common Core Math Standards mm -hmm. and the ABMR framework. Okay. Um, so our first question is uh, from Malcolm Cunningham about how do you manage the Common Core process standards and mathematics? Yeah, so um, the process standards are really kind of baked into how we think about approaching instruction. So we have a set of guiding principles that we all of our courses are based off of, and those guiding principles include the process standards. The pink book that I referred to um, from Sage Publications, uh, I'll just hold it up here, Teaching Mathematics Conceptually actually kind of overlays how our guiding principles um, make that connection to those process standards. So when we think about, uh, for example, um, 
using structure to support students, one of the process standards. Um, we have a domain and structuring number that's specific to helping teachers understand how to use tools to promote the use of structure and how those questions will go along with it. We also have um, what we call progressive mathematization that really helps us to think about what are different structures that we want students to pay attention to. So in place value, that idea of the groups of 10 and because becoming really fluent with a unit of 10 and 10 ones is simultaneously the same thing. And how does that apply to more levels of units? So we do embed those process standards in our guiding principles. I hope that was a good answer. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's the way I see it too. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Um, so we have another question. This was kind of covered from Andrea Lagala. Um, she came in a little bit late, but I think it's a really great topic to revisit. So I'm um, wondering if you have guidance for how you would prioritize instruction after administering the USNS or the ABMR diagnostic assessments. So question to both of you. So it's, that's actually, I'm going to go ahead and take take the first part of that because, uh, you know, this comes up quite a bit, actually. A lot of people ask, you know, how is it that you, what, what should I prioritize? I've got a student who's, who's shown um, struggles across all of the, the, the questions of the assessment, for example. So what do I start with? Um, I will say that, that this learning framework and number that Kristen's talking about can give you a really good idea of where to start with that, right? Because it's got kind of a sequence built into it that you can look at and then you can kind of play around with different pieces. And, and, and Krista kind of said, you know, there's a kind of a dance with this. And, and I think that it's not always obvious, which is the, the starting point. Um, and that's why it's one of those things of really digging deep with understanding how to do those with the students. The advantage mass assessments themselves will, will give you more information on that. Um, I also suggest that if you, if you don't have the advantage mass uh, training, that you can drop back a grade level with the, uh, the USNS assessments and try to get some more information there. Looking for strengths is the most important thing. Understanding what a student does know, that will identify the starting points. So if you've got a student who can count to three, awesome, there's a starting point for you. And, and thinking about thinking about uh, trying to identify those those assets that the students bring with them will point you in the right direction usually. I don't know yeah. if you want to. Yeah, I want to. Um... So I think this is a really complex question that we oversimplify in the educational world, you know, and we, we think it's this very linear process, but we know, like David said, that students um, noticing their strengths and building on their strengths, they actually, Zaretta Hammond talks about this, that they can, if we build cognitive structures with them, they can actually fill in the gaps of what they are missing. So when we think about prioritizing instruction, we can think about it from how do I provide that access to the grade level lesson? So is that a tool? Is that a visual? What might, what might I do? So first I need to understand my grade level and where the child is in relation to that grade level so that I can help them participate during that lesson because helping them to build up those visuals will they'll be able to actually um, take those experiences that they might not be having and, and, and move them forward at a much faster pace. But that targeted instruction, where I really want to focus my attention, that's where the learning framework in number helps us a lot. So thinking about when you come to the course, I know I showed you a graphic that overlays the standards, but when you actually come to ABMR training, you receive what's called a classroom instructional framework, and you can look across to see what are some areas that I might look at at prerequisite knowledge to support a student in access. And so that would help you to prioritize the areas that you would go a little bit deeper in, in terms of instruction for students. Yeah, it is complex. Thank, thank you both. Um, for sharing that information about the complexity and making it kind of revisiting this question that we've heard so many times too. And I think that was a really great response. Um, two questions to you, Kristen, uh, both from uh, Sarah Gork. Uh, questions about Ready, Set, Math. Could you share a link to Ready, Set, Math? And would it be helpful in providing tier two math intervention in the classroom? Uh, 
Yeah, we actually see a lot of districts adopting this for that specific purpose, that targeted instruction purpose. So I have my grade level lesson, like I said, on this, you know, I already know what I'm doing to scaffold, but I actually need the lessons for that targeted instruction. And so Ready, Set, Math would um, provide lessons in all of the that colorful document in all nine of those domains, and they have sub goals within them. So they're very helpful when you think about using that data to then plan those targeted instruction. I think David put in a link specifically to Ready, Set, Math. Um, you can also go um, to that QR code. I can go back um, and we can send you information specifically on that Ready, Set, Math. So right here. Thank you. I'll make sure I grab that link in the follow-up email too so we can have that. Great, thanks. Um, a question to David. Uh, this is from one of our clients uh, from Des in Des Plaines. Christina Bowman is asking, are the ABMR diagnostic assessments already built within Forefront? If yes, can we have them added to our account? So we have, so Forefront is is a is a data collection tool and it can be configured for, for a very, very wide variety of assessments as, as a lot of our clients are aware. We do have a pre-configured solution for those who are collecting data from the Advantage Math Assessments. If you if you are trained and you have those, the assessments themselves are not built into there. It's simply a spreadsheet. Um, really, what is what we're talking about here? So, so just so you know that if you have the if you have access to the to the materials that you have gotten through the training, um, then we can help you with with doing that. So, Christine, just reach out to our support, and we'll uh, we'll get you set up with that. Um, two questions uh, along the same lines, which are uh, one from Mr. Kabir Usman in Nigeria, and then we have Rachel Stockton. Uh, questions about the ABMR training. What is the involvement, the time commitment, and the length of the training for ABMR? Yeah, the length of the training for, we have three different um, courses. We have a course one, course two, and a fractions training, and they're all 24 hours of commitment. It really depends on the format. So we do have districts that um, do training within their district. And those are four days of um, instructional time or professional development time. We also have a virtual option and offer courses um, regularly. So right now we have uh, courses starting up at the end of January, running all the way through April. And they are eight two-hour sessions. And there's a one-hour asynchronous work in between them. Um, two more questions here. Uh, if trained in AVMR, does that include access to the Ready, Set, Math supplemental resource? It does not. Yeah, Ready, Set, Math is a supplemental resource that's separate from the Advantage Math Recovery. And then the last question, this will be for David uh, from Nicole Leitz. District-wide, we're required to use the NWA map as a screener three times a year. From there, do we do AV, we do uh, AVMR assessments with any students under the 21st percentile? Wondering if we should do the forefront screener before doing the one-on-one -on -one assessment or the AVMR, um, it, I, excuse me, I believe the forefront universal screener for number sense before doing the one-on-one -on -one assessments. Um, you know, these are these are obviously good decisions to make at, at your district. Um, I think what I would, maybe consider doing is is thinking about doing the screener um, for the grade level first um and then that could if if unless if you want to do the full battery of the assessments within advantage math that's one thing um if you think that you might be able to target more be, be more targeted and specific you could give the universal screeners for mathematics first and then that might point you to which of the advantage math assessments you might want to give um is one way to think about that um you know, and and so you know this the this idea of the twenty first percentile, I, I get that. I get why why people want to do that. What what I feel the value is with the universal screeners, and why I like to ad advise districts to give them to everyone is that there are needs that every student has, and there are things that that we can support every student with if we understand those students better. And sometimes we miss things when we're just looking at a percentile cutoff. So you might have a student who's done well overall, they come through at the 35th percentile maybe, but they are unable to recite the number word sequence, for example. 
um, something that is going to be completely missed by your NWEA screener because it cannot assess whether students know how to count, right? And so, so this is one of those things where it's sort of like, if you don't know, if you don't actually listen to a child count, you will not, will not know. I, I really would love to see that everybody sits down with every student to find out how well they can count forwards and backwards, because there's no way to do that through a web-based, you know, computer screener. Um, and so, so my preference, do the screeners instead of NWA or in addition to NWA, perhaps, and then, and then, and then, you know, dig deeper with your ABMR assessments as need be. Um, but it is a complex problem when you've got layers on of layers upon layers of assessments and you want to try to keep it efficient, of course. I don't know how well I answered that. <laughs> oh, I think it's great. I think it, reiterating that it's just, it's a complex problem just to support student learning in the classroom. Um, those are the end of our questions here, almost at the end of the hour. I wanted to say thank you to both of you. This is our first collaborative um, collaboration with the U.S. Math Recovery Council on our first webinar that we worked on together. So a lot of preparation. So big thank you to Kristen and to David for the time that you spent preparing. And we'll be sharing out the resources that were shared today, as well as a recording link within a day, too, so that you can continue that learning and learning more about the work of both the Math Recovery Council and Forefront and the Universal Screeners for Number Sense Project. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your questions and looking forward to supporting you as you're supporting your students and making sense of this wonderful data that you're collecting. Thanks, thanks Kristen. So thanks, thanks, David. Everyone. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.